the language we use today was designed hundreds of years ago, and that makes it almost impossible to talk to one another. We really talk at each other. Now that's very hard to conceive of because we're brought up in a world where that appears normal. And in ancient Rome, they used to feed Christians lions. But they would starve the lions, put on a better show, about a week without food. And they'd remove the clothing from the Christians, so it'd make it easier for the lions to tear them apart. And families used to come on weekends, or whenever they had the show, to watch Christians being fed the lions. And children would say, Daddy, can I come next week to see Christians fed for lions? And Daddy would say, if you behave yourself. <laughs> well, is anything wrong with Daddy? Nothing is wrong. That's normal to their society. Just as your society watches prize fights, men punching each other's heads around. There's a brain in there. It's always damaged. But the things we like to see, a tightrope walker walking between buildings, automobiles going around in circles doing nothing, these are the things we get conditioned to. And we think, I guess, that's human nature. There's no such thing as human nature. All people are shaped by culture. For example, if you, I don't know you, were raised as a baby by the headhunters of the Amazon, if he never saw anything else, he'd be a headhunter. And if I said to him, doesn't it bother you to have five shrunken heads? He says, yes, my brother has 20. <laughs> is he a bad guy? No. Everybody is perfectly well adjusted where they're coming from. If you're brought up in the South, you're going to speak with a Southern accent. If you're brought up in France, la tour Eiffel, vive la France. No. And they brought up in Germany, Heil Hitler, Deutschland over Haus. Anything wrong with the German families? No. They're brought up in a fixed, closed culture. So all of us are shamefully inadequate. They do not teach in school how to relate to one another, how to get along, how to find meaning in your own lives. They teach you how to be a cog in the wheel, become a mechanic, a doctor, a lawyer, or a structural engineer, but never overview. They never tell you how people get to be the way they are. I'm going to try in this short time to tell you a little bit of how people get to be the way they are. When I was 21, I worked my way onto a boat uh, to Hawaii and from there to Tahiti. And I wanted to see how people would be if they weren't brought up the way we were. And uh, I got to Tahiti, it seemed that the Chinese owned most of the stores then, and they had a money system going. So I wanted some out islands that were relatively untouched. And that's called the Tuamotu chain. This was 65 years ago. And so when I got there, I brought mirrors and beads, which I was going to give out to the natives to show I come as a friend. But they were already in my hut giving out the mirrors and beads with a great big grin on their face. And of course I didn't understand it, coming from a monetary system. I said, what's going on? They said, you have too many mirrors and beads. So they were giving them out. I did not understand that until about three days later, when the older people were pulling in a net full of fish, and they threw fish to anyone standing there. They'd say, you owe me 10 bucks, you owe me four bucks. They just gave it away. But the most surprising thing is that they were walking around without clothing, all of them, men and women, except a few men that climbed trees, made a kind of a jock strap so their balls won't get caught in the branch. <laughs> but other than that, they did walk around nude, and I never saw a male stare at a female body, because they've been swimming nude ever since they were kids. There were no fetishes. No tit men, leg men, ass men, hair men, gone, because they were brought up nude swimming together. There were no girly magazines that guys bought, because they, there was nothing to see. If you think about it, if you cover a girl's nose and say, oh, guy, did you ever see a girl's nose? You know, show them a little bit, you'll have to lose in the car. He's brought up to that. 
There's nothing about the female body that stimulates men. They think that's human nature. That's the way men are. That isn't the way they are. That's the way they're brought up. And also in the islands, they made love wherever they wanted to when they were old enough to. There was no seduction. You didn't have to play a violin, take a girl out to a harmonious environment with good food and seduce her. Gone. When they were young enough, they had sex and nobody ever talked about it. That's all men talk about in this culture. And women think that's how men are. Again, they're not. They're made that way. Don't get mad at them. They're made that way by this culture. <laughs> if you still don't understand that, when the men in the islands made love to a woman, they put their hands on top of the ones they meet like you. They stroked the whole female. There were no peeping toms, which wouldn't occur if everybody would swim nude. There were no uh, sex crimes, because they had sex. So the church came along and said, you only use sex when you get married. If that were true, the pecker would come out the day he got married. <laughs> This whole story that you get, to be truthful, be honest. When kids come over to you and say, what brings babies here? The stork. That's a lie. Where do you get all those gifts on Christmas? Papa, Mama? No. Santa Claus. That's another lie. We lie continuously, then we pump our kids full of shit. We pump them, you're a Lutheran, you're proud of it. You're a Catholic, you're proud of it. You're an American, you're proud of it. And you're Irish and you're proud of it. Well, if you, any normal boy or girl, was brought up in Ireland, they'd speak a certain way. The facial expressions such as, he's a fine Irish lad. Probably from Dublin. Well, you'd speak that way. If you're brought up in Australia, you'd probably say things like, how are you, Mike? <laughs> so, is that inborn? Of course not. You pick it up from your environment. Thank you. <coughs> if you have difficulty understanding that, a man brought up in the South or a woman will speak with a Southern accent. If you said stop speaking with a Southern accent, they can. And they'd say things like this, I'm who get me a nigga and I'm going to kick his ass. Is that inborn? No, he picks it up in the environment. And the geneticists are looking for the Republican gene. They're looking for the Democratic gene or the gay gene. There's no such thing. It's environment that shapes your values, behavior, and your facial expressions. And if you were brought, brought up in Germany and all you see is Heil Hitler, Deutschland over alles, Germany above all. Brought up in America, the greatest country in the world. Well, all that's bullshit. The world you live in is a bullshit world. Now, those of you that are bothered by language, too bad. Anyway. Yeah. There are no bad words. Maybe when a girl bakes a pie and she drops it, he says, oh, fiddly dee. A guy might say shit. That means I'm sorry I dropped the pie. It has nothing to do with shit. When a guy says bullshit, it means I can't accept what you're saying. It has nothing to do with the shit of a bull. <laughs> so you've got to understand language. And the language we use every day is subject to interpretation. If you don't understand that, when you say something to somebody, it goes in the head and comes out different. And so you say, that's not what I say. Oh, yes, you did. So when people read the Bible, you open it, and this is what Jesus meant. The other person says, you're wrong. He meant that. The third person says, you're both wrong. He meant this. So you have the Lutheran, the Seventh-day Adventist, the Catholic, only because it's subject to interpretation. If you hope to live in a world that's saner, you have to have a language that has uniform meaning. Is that possible to develop a language that is not subject to interpretation? Mathematics is not subject to interpretation. Chemistry. When chemists talk, they understand the same symbols all over the world today. And mathematics is similar all over the world. And when it comes to engineering, 
If engineers talk to each other, they don't say, believe me, this is the strongest metal. They say it's tensile strength is so much, torsion strength so much, compression strength, they understand each other. If an engineer designed a bridge that was subject to interpretation, they wouldn't know what size beams to use. And in the Air Force, when you fly airplanes, the language is not subject to interpretation. You couldn't operate anything that makes sense with the everyday language. So, with this everyday language, you have confusion, conflict, disagreement. Scientific language is very different, and politics is very different. Politicians say things people like to hear. That's how you win approval. approval. You got five children, how oh, nice. Everything you say is nice. They want to get elected. But scientists do not speak to win approval. There was a time when most people believed the Earth was flat. The scientist says, you're a victim of error. Let me show you why and how it's round. And they went out and they didn't say, it's a little round and a little flat, and you get along with everybody. That is not the business of science to win approval. If you find out that people live near a swamp and there's malaria, you tell them, you try to tell them about malaria. And they say, but my grandmother lived there, my grandfather for years. That's got nothing to do with it. Now today, or I should say a little bit yesterday, they used to pour oil on swamps to keep the mosquito lobby from coming out of the water. But that killed the fish. So they got confused again. So they did something else. They spray poisons on the swamp. That goes down to the water table. But you do get rid of the mosquitoes. It kills all the fish, too. So really, what do you do? I'm going to try to tell you what the Venus Project concerns are. Not criticizing the country, but offering positive alternatives to every problem. Instead of having a sign, please drive carefully, slippery when wet. We put abrasive in the highway, so it's not slippery when wet. There's a sign, drive carefully, school children crossing. Well, if a mother is driving a car and the kids are fighting in the back car, she turns around and says, will you kids stop that? That those few seconds, she can kill people. So what we do is when the kid wants to cross the street, he presses a button and the gate doesn't open until the highway turns up like that, so no car can hit a kid. That's what you really want. Now, sometimes people come over me and say, they're nature lovers. I say, really? Yes, I've been a nature lover all my life. You mean you like hurricanes, earthquakes? All natural. Tornadoes, floods, disease, all natural. No one can be a nature lover if you're honest. There's some aspects you don't like. Big earthquakes kill thousands of people, and if the place is highly dense, hundreds of thousands of people. Hurricanes and tsunamis drown people all over the world. Disease killed, well, the bubonic plague did, half the Earth's population at one time. So don't come off with that, I'm a nature lover. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so when you meet people and they use words like, this man is good, what does that mean? Does it tell you anything? When a teacher said, that's wrong, those words don't tell you anything. Think about it. If the teacher says, that's not what I told you, that doesn't tell you anything. So in the future, when children spell cat, say with a K, like they do here, perhaps. <laughs> and, and, and the teacher says, that's wrong, the kid doesn't get anything specific. But if you draw a line under it and say, very close, it's just this first letter, the K, in America, that we change to C. But don't say it's wrong. Right, wrong comes from religion. If, if, you, if the kid spells cat with a K and you say we use a C and he draws a C the wrong way, just say much closer, isn't it? But don't say it's wrong because there's no information in that. The language we use when a guy says to a girl, I love you, what the hell is that? <laughs> Not a thing. Nobody ever says that to me. No, they say things to girls which are fantastic. Hey, you too. They would say, hey, Fresco, I love your bald head. They never say that. So what is our language all about? It's an ancient system of poor communication. 
subject to interpretation. That's why lawyers exist. They can take language, bend it around, do whatever they want with it, if they're good lawyers. And there's nothing the matter with lawyers, as long as they got their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> so, if you really think about it, think about the world you live in. All your movies are the same story. Who's screwing who? And they call it having an affair. I've been to over a hundred restrooms and never found a place to rest. <laughs> they can't even talk about the world of reality. All your newspapers are slanted to all the established culture. The culture that made people successful. So they keep it that way. Politicians are not elected to change things. They're there to keep things as they are. And all nations do that. You're a patriotic American. I'm Irish and I'm proud of it. I'm a Italiano. I'm proud of it. See? So all that stuff separates people. And the separation of people has been going on for centuries. And they think it's human nature. It's not. There is no human nature. Even a murderer, a serial killer, is made that way by society. I'm sure you have difficulty with that. But if you're brought up in the South, you say, I'm going get, to get a nigger and hang him up on a tree by his neck. Even that's learned. You inherit no language. The real good proof of that is China. They've been speaking Chinese for thousands of years. No Chinese baby was ever born speaking Chinese without going to school. And they used to think, if you take a Chinese baby and a British baby and bring them to China, the Chinese baby will learn Chinese faster. Not true. It takes the same time. So what you acquire in your environment cannot be passed on except genetic differences, like the shape of your nose, the color of your eyes. That's genetic. But greed, murderers, that's usually learned. And if there's brain damage, person should not be executed. But if you're brought up in the South to hate blacks, Filipinos, Greeks, and Orientals, that isn't you really. It's the influence environment had on you. So why put him in jail? If a guy steals a watch worth 150 bucks, fourth crime, he might get six years in jail. That's several hundred watches. It's cheaper to give him a watch. <laughs> Think about it. We put, put people in jail for 20 years. You feed them and clothe them, medical care. Why not give them a pension? So if kids want to go to college today and they can't afford it, some of them work at night to help pay it off, or they wind up with a debt of $40,000 if you want to be a doctor or something like that. Now, a doctor in the money system is not always trustable. You can't always trust people. Because when he says your kidney has to come out, how do you know he's not trying to pay off a new little boat or house? So you see, it's very hard in the monetary system. And also, we don't trust each other because we say sign here. That means you don't trust people. So the system is rotten to the core, including all churches. I hate to say that. But if you take religion, for example, you will find that God is made in the image of man guy sitting on a throne that gets angry, creates floods, disease. That isn't God. That's a psychopath. Made by <laughs> man. So don't take my word for it. Just open your Bible. It says, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say Wednesdays and Thursdays you can kill. It says, thou shalt not kill. Then it says, love thine enemy. When a man strikes you, turn the other cheek. There's nothing evil in that. The Bible says, Judge not, lest you be judged. Or oh, there but for the grace of God go I. That means you don't have any business judging anybody. Almost everybody does jury duty, judging people continuously. And the politicians and the judges and the lawyers and the Supreme Court in America will all be considered criminals in the same society. All the people that you are taught to admire are wealthy, fat people. I mean fat and wealthy. And I mean by that, they express the maximum of greed, and you grow up to admire them. Don't take my word for it. If you go to church, you'll see sometimes in the school across the way, a cannon. In the parks, men on horses with guns. 
Why don't they have Madame Curie, Louis Pasteur, the people that increase the agricultural yield? Why all the warriors? And do you know this? The cost of World War II. I'm not talking about the soldiers killed and the war tanks and the planes shot down. What we did to cities, Germany, we flattened it out. England was bombed flat. France bomb holes all over the place. If you had all those costs, you could have built hospitals all over the world, housed everyone, fed everyone, no poverty anymore, no more, no more crime. We could have wiped it out entirely. People commit crime usually when they're insecure. If you don't understand me, if you live near a waterfall with clean drinking water, nobody comes at night and steals water. <laughs> It doesn't happen that way if you live near a river of flowing water. But if there's a scarcity of water, I think in America you have to pay a buck for a glass of water today, because it's scarce. The air you breathe is absolutely essential for you to live, but there's so much of it, it's hard to put a price tag on it. Believe me, if they could, they would. There are people who would like to put a price tag on everything, and that's, that's learned. I'm not born mean or anything. Nobody is born mean. If you understand what I'm saying, if you want a world without war, without hunger, poverty, medical care, if you want a world where everyone works out all right, you have to declare the earth the common heritage of all the world's people. If you're religious, that should make sense to you. If you don't do that, if few nations control most of the Earth's resources, you're going to have territorial disputes continuously. War, you know what peace is? Interval between wars. There's never been peace on Earth. And the wars and the universities today are better equipped than ever. The bombs are getting worse. The bombs we drop on Hiroshima are nothing compared to the bombs we have today. They can really wipe out people very fast. And the airplanes today have more destructive power than ever. So what the hell is wrong with our society? The old values that you brought up with my country. I'm Irish and I'm proud of it. I'm Filipino and I'm proud of it. All of that crap. Because we owe so much to so many nations. Like the Arabs gave us algebra, mathematics, the zero. And Louis Pasteur, a Frenchman, gave most of us life. We owe so much to so many people. How can you kill God's creation? I'm talking to the religious people now. You know, in America, our president says, God bless America. Well, who the hell are you to tell God who to bless? <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd imagine they'd understand that right away. They don't seem to get it. People don't seem to understand anything. They want to kill criminals. Well, what's a criminal? And I said to me, in the Venus Project, what are you going to do with criminals? I said, when you go in and buy a box of Wheaties and you open it and it's half full, is that what you mean by criminal? Everybody's a criminal in this system. A lawyer that defends you, a judge that judges you is a criminal. Now, in our Bible, it says King Solomon had a thousand wives. We all respect King Solomon. But today he'd be arrested as a bigamist. <laughs> so all the people that you taught to life are the bums and derelicts of the century. They run the show. They make war. War is the most profitable business in the world today. And so the army grows through war. Industries make millions. When they draft you to serve or put up your life for this country, they should conscript all the war industries so no one makes a buck out of war. Then it's real. And if you had that, there wouldn't be any war. Think about it. So you can't patch up this system. It doesn't work. It's not good. It's behind the times. So they tell you, well, there were guys like Leonardo da Vinci, who was ahead of his time. He never was. The people were behind da Vinci. Da Vinci didn't come up with all those wonderful ideas. He associated with people that talked of gears and levers. You didn't know that. But Da Vinci, everybody can be Leonardo Da Vinci. And they tell you that the machine age 
began with a wheel. They tell you that somebody invented the wheel. A lie. A tree fell over another tree, and when you pulled it, the bottom would roll. That suggested the wheel. Thank you. So, what I'm trying to do is tell you that all of us are shaped by culture. We ought not to judge other people, but we ought to learn how to help them, turn them around. So years ago, when I was about 17, I was designing this new society. And I said, what you're saying and writing about, Jack, that sounds good, but how do you know it'll work? How are you going to change the world's people? In, in the Arab world, the guy has not six wives. And in the other world, they have different concepts of God. So how do you change the world? So I said, I don't know. That's the most difficult thing to learn to say. I don't know. Because sometimes we ask people, you think man will ever get to the moon? Nah, not in a thousand years. You think that guy studied rockets and space travel? No. It's part of the crap you give people. Everyone should have a right to their own opinion. That's the worst thing you can do. If you lived across the way from me, and I saw 10 guys coming out of your apartment, I can have all kinds of opinions. She could be a language instructor, a ballet instructor. But if you give everybody a right to their own opinion, you damage society. Everyone should have access to information, like the internet. It's the greatest liberator, and there are a lot of people who would love to control the internet. And if they ever do that, we're pretty much doomed. Societies, America, for example, has enough H-bombs to destroy the world 50 times over. How stupid can you be? <laughs> what can you accomplish with that? We have 300 submarines in America, and according to the Bureau of Naval Operations, each submarine has more destructive power than all the wars in history. What are you going to win with that? And then there's a place for congressmen, I don't know how many of you know this, that can go under a mountain and there's enough food for six months. How many of you knew that? Very well, about one-third of the people here. What do you come out to after six months? A radioactive world? I'm trying to tell you that congressmen and senators are stupid beyond description. <laughs> because they don't know anything. Don't take my word. Walk over to your own congressman and say, how would you prevent the automobile accidents? I don't know. How can you transmit electric power over lines with minimum losses? I don't know. How can you grow enough food to feed everyone on a, I don't, they don't know anything. Try it sometimes. Now, when you fly in a commercial airliner, you don't have to write the pilot and say you've been flying at an angle for three hours, straighten up. He knows the business. The people in Washington should understand human behavior, environmental problems, so they're experts of that day. We never can arrive at utopia. People think I'm a utopian. I believe in a perfect world. I do not. The cities that I design are the best I know up to now but the new city will be a straitjacket for the kids of the future. They'll design their own cities. And if you make a statue of me and honor me, that holds things back. Everybody can be Leonardo da Vinci if you know how to do it. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about that. When my kid came to me and said, Daddy, when he was four years old, the wheel came off my toy car. And I said, so it did. And I threw it in the garbage, and I picked up my paper, and I'm reading it. But I'm watching that one eye, that lower lip. Go, where are you? <laughs> What's the matter? He said, you're throwing it away. I said, I'll get your baby toys where the wheels don't come off. He said, well, maybe I can fix it. And I reached for it and gave it to him. And he's trying to get the wheel on. Gets it on. Then you pick him up and say, that's wonderful. How did you do that? He says, I'm not that little, Daddy. Well, that's when you encourage a kid. You know, let daddy fix it, let mommy fix it. You produce a blob. <laughs> Don't you see? So to make creative people, you never hold up the younger child and play with it while the seven-year-old's standing with that little 
And when the younger kid falls down the stairs, the seven-year-old has the grip. <laughs> he has been treated unfairly. Mothers do not know today how to raise children. I wanted my child to learn to read. I never read, taught him to read. I used to read to him at night in bed. And I'd read to him about what kids are interested in. And then I go like a, the most interesting part of the book, I close it. He said, Daddy, what happened? I said, look, if you learn to read, you can find out from yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give kids a reason to want to read. A reason to want mathematics, not today, two and two is four, four and four is eight, and they wrote memory like robots. If you really want them to think, you have to arrange conditions. They won't let any person touch a jet engine unless you go to school. Humans are much more complicated than any jet engine, and they'll let any mother raise a child which shocks the shit out of me. I can't understand that. Women will go to school and learn how to raise children. Let me give you another idea. When my little girl was three years old, she walked into my lab, and I put a wrench on her, not the wrong way, intentionally. It kept slipping. I put her on the wrong way again. She put her little hand on it and said, that's no way to do it, Daddy. I said, how about this? She said, no, I'll have to show you. I put it on the right way. The reason I did that is to get her to think about things not just look at a daddy who knows everything. That's a bad way to raise children. Another time, I talked to my little boy about animals that he would be interested in. Then I said to him, how would you like to go to the zoo and see those animals? He said, wonderful, when? I said, next month. Next month? That's to give him a hunger for it. If you take him there right away, you lost him up. So when, but near the end of the month, the kid was anxious as hell. And he was looking at all the elephants and rhinos with great detail. And I said, I have a business appointment in town. I can only stay another five minutes. He said, well, Daddy, this is interesting. I said, I'm sorry. I did not have a business appointment. And when I got that kid home, I put clay and drawing paper in his room. And he's making elephants and rhinos. Not very good. But there he is making these things. So I said, outside and play with the boys. He said, but I like being alone making things. I said, outside play. That's a story of Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. None of them were raised normally. So you have to know what the conditions are that make what they call a genius. Today they say, just born that way. I guess I'm just a natural born artist. Artists, don't get mad at me now, are the most backward people in the nation. <laughs> because they think what they do comes naturally. You say, how come you can draw so well? So, I don't know, I guess I've just been drawing for years. But they don't know how to transfer the information. Sometimes a surgeon will give a student medic a scalpel and practice on a cadaver. And the student would sink in and out while he's cutting the line. And the professor would say, have you ever considered becoming a diagnostician rather than a surgeon? Well, really. I photographed this guy working, and he puts his hand on the body, sets the scalpel, and rises his fingers. That's how he controls the depth. So I showed that to that medical student. He cut perfect lines on the cadaver. So this doctor was amazed. He said, how, how come you can do such a good job now? Yesterday you were lousy. Because he was a lousy instructor, but a good surgeon. There are many good people who are very good at things, but they're not good at transferring information. So I did an experiment with little girls with the permission of their parents. I ran cowboy pictures for two weeks for little girls about 10 years old. And after about two weeks, the little girls would walk around. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all, if that's all you see, that's all you do. Now this is more difficult to understand. If three or four effeminate women, I mean very effeminate, women talk differently, facial expressions, hands. Oh, did I see a gorgeous hat? Their facial motions, their hands are different. So if four of those women bring up a normal boy, he will say, oh, I'd like to go too. <laughs> you see, people are shaped by culture. Nobody's born gay. 
Nobody is born any particular way. They say, well, I guess he just went with goddamn queers. See, we don't know anything. We don't, I'm not educated in school. We get mad at people. We put them in jail, but they become super criminals. Jail is the worst thing you can do to a human being. So I want to tell you this, that I really would like to see a world without war, and I don't mean these guys who want to put a green roof on a building and a couple of trees. That is not the answer. The answer is the way we think and the way we look at the world. If you design a very good city and put normal people, normal means fucked up, into that city, <laughs> you would have nothing but trouble. So before you move into the new cities, you're oriented to how that city works. You know, nobody's put in an airplane to learn to fly. They put them in a dummy plane. You move the controls, that's phase one. Then you put them in a real plane. You show them how to check the tires, water and the fuel. And if you want a doctor, you put them in a medical environment. You want a businessman, you put him in a business environment. You want a structural engineer, in a structural engineering environment. That's what a university is. And people don't believe in environment. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. Environment shapes everything. And everybody in America that I've known admires George Washington as the first president of the United States. What they don't know is that George Washington was worth many millions of dollars, which is not bad. What is bad is he had 300 slaves. How many of you knew that? Not one hand. One hand. Okay. So is George Washington good or bad? He's a bum. No good at all. Anybody like that. So all your presidents, all your congressmen are stupid individuals. Otherwise, they would try to bridge the difference between nations, not convert soldiers into killing machines. That's what a human soldier is. We would send them back to school as problem solvers, learn how to bridge the difference between nations. Now, I've said a lot of things, so I'll open this portion to questions. And please, don't be polite. If I fail to answer your question, say you didn't answer my question. Okay? Yeah. yeah, when everything is free, drugs will be readily available as well. And even though there would be less reason to escape reality by using drugs, people are still curious and they would like to experience it. How would you deal with that? People getting addicted to drugs. These gadgets don't work too good, so Roxanne oh. will interpret that. Okay. Okay. Do you know what the question is? Can you, um, can you, is this on? Yes. Okay. Can you repeat that question? Um, yeah. What I said was, when everything is free, drugs will be readily available as well. And even though there would be less reason to use drugs, because, well, they're all happy, <laughs> how would the society deal with that problem? Because people are still curious, and they would like to experience how would the deal with drugs. First of all, people make money selling drugs. You're aware of that. There's no money available in the society. So you can't sell drugs. No one would make anything, make any money. And so you don't sell anything. You can't pay off a politician. You can't have the drug company influence people. Say uh, a big drug company finds out that celery juice lowers blood pressure. Why make that available? You can't sell it, you can't make money, so they make these pills where you get three bucks a piece for it. You can't make money telling the public, live naturally, try not to spray poisons on your food. You can't make money doing that. So the system is inherently corrupt. Now, people don't use drugs unless they're stressed out, unless they don't feel good and they take it, makes them feel better. In the future, all kids, all people, to, well, today, I notice a lot of kids hanging out in America in malls. There should be art centers, music centers, cultural centers for them to go. There's no place to go. For the kids, if they've ever tried pot, you know, you try it because and, and the kids today are really fucked up badly. They're running needles through their tongues, and hanging things through their ears. They might as well put a bone through their nose, like the old time. 
So they don't know what's important. They want to belong to a group. And when you do that, when you put some metal plate through your tongue or your lip, you identify with a group. That's the same as Indians dancing around a fire with a feathered hat. La, 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 la. How they dance around. You say, that's ridiculous doing that. The Indian doesn't say, you know, I never thought of it that way. That's very interesting. He gets mad at you. Because people are brought up to believe that what they do is good. Like the American, Afro-Americans in Africa, they weave their hair. They spend hours doing that. That's a nothing thing. A something thing is education on how to increase agricultural yield, not weaving the hair for three hours. So really, people don't know what's significant. Now, I want to tell some of you this. If you beat a drum on the left side of a person, on this side, boom, boom, boom. That causes the muscles of this leg to move very slightly. And if you put the drum on the other side, beat the left, yeah, and hence you get this. Hey man, that's really cool. Dancing is a nothing thing, but people move around with each other, and you think it means something. You're brought up that way. The book called Thorsten Veblen's Theory of the Leisure Class. I'm sure it isn't in most of your school. He said that Wealthy people in the old days used to hire many people to stay in the hallway like that. The more people you had doing nothing, the more respect you commanded. But these people just wiped their nose on their sleeve. <laughs> so a guy put buttons along there. I'll tell you. <laughs> it didn't work. So they put buttons all around the sleeve. That's how come men have buttons on their jackets which do nothing. <laughs> now Thorsten Bevan said if a girl was born with a sloping chin, person in a high place. She designed garments that stuck up like that, so you couldn't see the sloping chip. And everybody in the court wanted one. And then when smallpox cocked the face, the important people had veils designed, so you couldn't see the detail of the skin. And everybody in the court wanted a veil. I'm trying to tell you that people are loused up by society. The world I'm talking about, if you love art, you can go to school, you don't need money. You can study anything you want to study. And some people think that Fresco thinks more about machines than he does people. That's a lie. I want to tell you about the machines I'm talking about. When I was a kid, people used to look out of an airplane and say, I'm about a mile high. Today there's Doppler radar. It hits the earth, comes back, and tells you exactly how high. No man can do that when we don't have that kind of ability. So I want to put that in all airplanes. It's already in most airplanes. Because man can't do that. About nine months ago, computers were able to handle 1,000 trillion bits of information per second. No group of humans can do that. I don't care what heredity or school they went to. That's why I talk of machine government. Not to, to rule out people. People can't keep tab on all the world's resources, malaria, ocean currents, hurricanes. We can't do it. So the future machines will not, I want to repeat this, will not control people. Only production of goods and services making it available to people. That's transportation, farming, but they will not control people. However, Hollywood makes movies of the robot choking the designer. Or you go see Star Wars, and there they're producing laser weapons. They're the same cowboys and Indians in space. They can't conceive of a future of peaceful living and smart kids. Kids always want to know, Daddy, what makes it rain? Daddy, what keeps the moon up there? And you give them the Mickey Mouse Club. Or you give them some other crap like Cinderella, who touches a white rat and becomes a horse. If you fill <laughs> the kids' minds with garbage like that, what can you expect in the future? So kids want to know everything. They want to know how the electric light works, why there are people living in old, broken houses, and Daddy says, there'll always be the poor amongst us. But what about killing war? Well, there'll always be wars and rumors of war. It said so in the Bible. I got no use for those statements. Just say, I can't conceive of a world without war. I can't even visualize it. 
Well, you ask a normal person if they were honest and brought up in good, in a good, healthy environment, do you think we'll ever get to the moon? They would say, I know nothing about rockets. I don't even know how man would survive in space. I cannot answer that. I don't know. But everybody can answer anything. Yes. I have a question for you, Jacques. Uh, a couple of years ago, I heard about uh, bacteria being produced to clean up chemical and toxic Hello. waste. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> years ago, I heard about bacteria being developed and uh, to get rid of toxic spills, uh, nuclear uh, waste, stuff like that. Do you have any idea how far these uh, developments are proceeding at this point? They are using it experimentally, but that isn't the problem. The real toxic waste is the mind of man. If you don't change that, you're going to have all one thing after the other to work on. We want to work on the whole environment as an operation. The cities of the future are round, for those of you that have seen that. The middle of the city has everything, medical care, school. So if you live adjacent, if you work in the medical center, there are houses there for you. And the way the trees are arranged, you can't see another house. It's a slow S. And there's brooks and ponds and waterfalls. And you can't see the industrial buildings. And all industrial buildings are equipped with a, a guy named Cottrell about 80 years ago designed the Cottrell precipitator, where dust and smoke go past two parallel plates and become charged. And when they get to the next set of plates, they're attracted to it. So just warm air comes out of all factories, no more smoke. Eighty years ago, I've only seen it on two factories in the world. No. Why? Because they don't have to do that. If politicians knew about technology, they don't know anything. That's what I'm trying to tell you. They may be nice guys, too, which I doubt, but <laughs> they don't really know it. So if you elect people to political office, or you elect military people to the, in the Pentagon, or else they grow by being mad, the Pentagon thinks a certain way. So they give Army and Navy the latest technical equipment. They had that at Pearl Harbor. And two soldiers using radar said, there's a bunch of planes coming toward Pearl Harbor. So they told it to a captain. Yeah, they're probably our planes. And that was a Japanese attack. Then we have all kinds of military bases. And these people hijacked two airplanes, more than two really, and flew into the towers. So you say, why are those damn Arabs making weapons? Why are they, the North Korea building armies, marching in rockets and all that? Why is China doing that? I'm going to try to tell you why. There's a newspaper in England called The Telegraph. Don't take my word for it, you can write for it. Headlines, U.S. intends to bomb nuclear seven cities. How many of you knew about that? Uh, one hand. Oh yeah, one hand. U.S. intends to bomb nuclear, seven cities, sneak attack, by the way. And then it names the city, China, North Korea, on down the line. What would you do if China said, we intend to flatten out America? Ain't nothing press. You'd arm to the tooth. But that information is censored, kept away from you, except by the telegraph. I don't know why they ran it, but the Pentagon released it. If the Pentagon intended to do that, they were stupid to release it. I'm trying to tell you how stupid people are. The Pentagon wanted a strong defense system in the northern region over Canada in case the Russians came over. Do you think the Russians would come over that heavily armed area? They come over another area. In New York, they have a place called Fort Hamilton. It's a big fort with guns that come up. You're operating on the assumption they're coming up New York Harbor. They'd come any other way. There's nothing man can think of that another nation can't think of to counteract that. Now, this is something I wouldn't do. I can design clothing that gives off poison gas, so when you get on an airplane, you can x-ray the hell out of it. It won't show. No method. You can't bring a knife, spoon, or fork on an airplane. But when you're traveling first class, they give you a steel knife, fork, and spoon. 
Then they tell you, under your seat is a life raft. You pull it out, and pull it in, blows up, and they show you how to get in. If you land in the North Sea, you'll live about 12 minutes with that life raft. So what you really want is a passenger section to disengage and keep you alive in the cold water with food and everything else. Now there was a time when they talked, the Arabs talked of a magic carpet. You sat on the carpet and you flew around. But if you had to take a leak, where did you go? <laughs> and, and if you had to eat, or if there was a rainstorm, you stuck on the carpet. Today you got an airline that was food, everything, washrooms, far beyond the magic carpet. The future will be fantastic, and everyone will live very well. The whole idea that a wealthy man today, or what they call capitalism, gives power to a lot of people and wealth, there's a future will have so many wonderful things to choose from that you'd be living in poverty, intellectual poverty, as a wealthy person today. Most of you live in poverty. I'm talking about intellectual poverty. They know where to invest money, but they don't know how to live. They don't know how to look at anything in the world, except I wonder how much acreage will sell for in this area. Well, I wonder where the building will bring. All their mind is turned toward money, which is the worst thing you can do with people. So I'm saying the middle class American today lives better than kings. He has television, cell phones. No king ever had that. He has heating in his home. He has wireless. He has airplanes. He has access to things. Now I'm saying the middle class American has that, that because of the ingenuity of others. And the world is carried on the backs of no more than a hundred people that made everything you like. Your electric lights, your sewing machines, your refrigerators, all that is made by very few people. And some people say, well, there's too much technology in the world. So I say, I'm coming over tomorrow, taking your refrigerator, your washing machine, <laughs> your lights, all, well, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> people don't even know what technology does. If you shut down Boulder Dam, all the food would spoil between L.A. and San Francisco. All the trains would stop. All the traffic lights would stop. They have no idea of what's important. When President Kennedy got up and made a speech, they thought that was important. All he said was, America, blah, blah, blah. France, blah, blah, blah. Never said anything. Politicians never say anything. Except that it's the greatest country in the world, isn't it? Anyway. <laughs> That's what I mean by nothing. Well, I know of no politicians throughout history that have developed anything. Yes, sir. You had a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, you have this uh, curious faith in technology and science, and uh, if you forget for a, for a moment that people uh, or science is uh, corporate, if the, there's this new uh, thing in science, it's called uh, chaotic systems. It's called uh, complex adaptive systems. And uh, what's it all about is there's no science for this. In complex systems, for instance, there is this uh, things like emergent properties, self-organizations. It's impossible to control this kind of science. And we have learned in the, in the recent times that most of the world around us is like this. It's like organic. It's economics. It's social, sociology. sociology. It's <laughs> difficult. But um, this faith of your in technology and science is based on classical science, classical mechanics, the old way of thinking, the new way of thinking, uh, let's call it holism, yeah? complex adaptive systems, complexity, makes things unpredictable, that you cannot make differential equations for it, there's no numer numerical methods to solve it, so how can science give us solutions when science doesn't know or understand the world? I'm uh, I'm not sure. I should be critical, you said. That many things he said are true today. Most scientists are victims of culture, just like other people are. However, the methods we use run like this, and what you have to do is point out the shortcomings of the Venus Project. Don't talk to me about classical science. I don't like it any more than you do. Now, the Venus Project says what you must do is take the state of Arizona. 
you must do a survey of how much arable land you have, how much water you have. That determines how big a city you can have. But if you just build a city and don't do a survey first, you're going to have problems. So when we build a dam in the Venus Project, we ask a group of scientists, what good will that dam do? And then they give you a whole list. After that, we have a negative retroaction study of what the damage is of that dam. That dam stops the tributaries, the beavers don't build dams, that changes the water table, trees die on the mountainside. So we never build anything without a negative retroaction study. So anyone doesn't know what that means? It means that in the aircraft industry, when they feel that an airplane wing can support 24 pounds per square foot, the engineers feel that, they pile sandbags on anyway and break the wing off at 27 pounds, then they know their calculations are right. Not only that, they hoist the airplane off the ground about 30 feet high, cut the string, and the fall to see if the landing gear holds up. I love that system. The Venus Project only uses that system. There is no what do you think, what do you think, what do you think. Put it to test. If you get a handbook of engineering, you'll see the different tables for concrete mixes, for 17-story buildings, four-story buildings. They have a handbook for that purpose. And of course, even if the Venus Project fails completely, uh, there are people called diagnosticians or skin specialists, dermatologists, and they are, when they go to school, they have to remember the different diseases, cystic fibrosis, psoriasis, they remember the patterns. Now, you can put all that in the computer in an hour and a half, mm. and then you can scan it and get the best treatment. I'd say about 10 to 15 years from now, there'd be no dermatologists. They're on the way out. Because M, man has a little desk computer today, and he's in touch with the world. It's very easy to take most of medicine and make it available by scanning. A girl said to me, would I be a waitress in the new society? I said, what makes you want to be a waitress? She said, I'm a waitress now. I said, when you sit at a table, the menu lights up. Then it scans you. If you're diabetic, it adjusts the food to your condition. You don't know how backward your society is. You have no idea what's missing. In 1927, we could have built a world without armies, navies, police, and housed everybody. You've got a bunch of stupid people running your society. I, I can only tell you that you may be projecting your values into me, what you think I would do. I would not do those things. I would do not make atomic bombs. The Army asked me when they drafted me, of course, can you make a bomb that goes out sideways? I said, I don't know how to do that. I know how to do that, but I won't, because I don't want to kill anybody. I think it's more advantageous to work out the difference between nations. So as a kid, I said, how the hell are they going to change the world? So I said, I don't know. Then later, I joined the Ku Klux Klan. I really met the head guy of the Klan. And he said to me, you're a smart guy, Jack. What do you think of the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan? I said, it's a great organization, but it doesn't go far enough. That gets us here. But if you attack, you get nowhere. You understand what I'm saying? OK. So he came over to my lab, and he was so impressed he said, will you come on down to the Klan and talk to our boys about what you're doing? I said, Lou, they wouldn't listen to me. He was in charge. He said, well, I'll get them to listen to you. And that was the mechanism. I turned them around in a month and a half. Then I joined the White Citizens Council. They hate foreigners, all foreigners. I turned them around in one month. And when I went back to New York, I asked a lot of people, what the most backward people are in New York. Now this, they said the Arabs. I said, what makes you think they're backward? They said, small group, still believe the earth is flat. So I said, Jack, if you can turn them around, it would be another good and useful thing. So I called always the head guy, the head Arab. I called him on the phone and said, I'd like to speak with you. He said, 
in an Arab accent with Arab facial roof, you are Arab? I said, eh, yeah. that means yes, an Arab. <laughs> he said, from where your father he born? You know what I mean. So I said, Lebanon. He said, very good, come and saw me. He'd come and see me. <laughs> when I came to see him, he said, you read the world around? I said, yes. He went, <laughs> where he comes from, that's normal to me. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so I said, boy, if I can't get to that guy, how the hell am I going to change the world? So I gave him a balloon, and I rubbed it with fur, fast. And I put cornflakes in his hand, told him to hold your hand away from the balloon. And by rubbing it very fast, all the cornflakes jumped up to the balloon, and his jaw hit the pavement. Conk. He said, world he magnet? I said, yeah. Ah! And he explained that to the Arabs. It took an hour and a half to turn him around. But if you use reason, gravitational field, they don't know what the hell you're talking about. So you must approach people in their terms, not your terms. So I always did put things to test to see if I can reach people with a very different point of view. And when we go to another country, we compare everything to our country. Really, Americans go to France and they live in the American club. They go to Italy, they go to the American club. If you want to get the feel of a country, live with an Italian family. Get the feel of it and get the feel of their values. Now, even Italians, when they come to America, they say, come on, they eat, this is good food. And that would be normal localization to a, an Arab or anybody that came that lived in Italy. And if you live in Australia, you say, oh, well, you might. And, and is that inborn? Of course not. A black man raised in Australia says, oh, well, you might. He doesn't say, that's right, you right. Mm -hmm. That's all picked up by environment, all dialect, all mannerisms. But we think we make choices, not truth. I ask Eskimos that never saw movies, never saw magazines, I said, what do you want? You can have anything you want, what do you want? They don't say a twin engine beach craft. They can't say that. They can't say I want a stainless steel heating unit for the igloo. No, they can only talk about things that they've seen. Do you understand that? An Eskimo never dreams of walking on a palm fringe beach with coconut trees. It's outside of their frame of reference. If a person is born blind, they touch combs, and they can tell you what it is very fast. If you blindfold a normal person, their fingers go over for a long while. Oh, that's a scissors. But a blind man, very fast. When a blind man dreams, the fingers move. Like that. A lot of people don't know that. The schools of the future will tell children how they get to be the way they are, what makes them think the way they do, what creativity is. And let me put it crudely, the schools of the future will be very different, and children will not say, I want a balloon. It won't be like that anymore. They'll be like little adults. They will understand geology, physics, chemistry, because kids are interested in anything. Don't fill their heads with garbage. And next question. Um, I'm really glad you're giving the detailed explanation, but there are a lot of questions. So if you could please put it a little shorter, that would be awesome. Uh, next question is for this guy. Um, I was wondering if you have uh, free uh, healthcare and um, healthcare gets better and better, how do you uh, deal with overpopulation? And I was also curious about uh, the role of the media in, uh, in the new society. You asked me first how you deal with overpopulation. Is that the first question? Okay, the answer is if you do a survey and you know how much land you have, arable land, if you know what the carrying capacity of the earth is, if you don't know that, what that means, it means how much oil do we have, how much arable land, how much water do we have, that should determine the way society operates, not some opinion. I hope I've answered that question. Also, in the future, there will be a lot more choices. Today, the role for most women is to have a family and have a husband and have kids. In the future, there will be many more options for people, not just that. Statistically, 
when there are educated people, they have less children. So there'll be a very different type of education in the future. Okay, I have a uh, next question. Uh, what was the problem with communism? It looks a, lick, a bit like this system in the pure way. So I'm not ta talking about Stalin or excesses, but only pure co communism. Communism uses money. They have stratification. They have banks, elitism. They're for the labor class. We're for the labor class in that we want to eliminate labor as quickly as possible. You know, in the labor, if you're concerned with labor today and you vote in higher wages for labor, then the price of the car goes up. The labor might be better, the labor class might have it better, but everybody else does not. So we want to bypass that system. Communism really didn't have a technical methodology of how to create abundance for everyone. Submarines, banks, money, we don't have any of that. Thank you. Um, the, he's asking what's the best way to increase public relations, uh, the Venus Project. We feel that the best way to introduce this direction is through films. You know, we're going on lectures and introducing it to maybe hundreds of people at a time. But for instance, Peter Joseph's film, Zeitgeist Addendum, which made this direction popular worldwide and created chapters all over the world of the Zeitgeist movement, which is the activist arm of the Venus Project. He did it through one film, very well done, about this direction. And now we have over hundreds and hundreds of chapters and people making media and people doing everything that they can, those who understand this direction, to promote it. So it's really, we feel, films. Jacques and I would like to do a major motion picture that goes to the general public to show what life would be like in the resource-based economy. And then answer, it will answer questions as to how we get from here to there. And we look at it kind of as social therapy. So when things start to break down more, people will know and understand what to advocate. If they don't know about this direction, it won't happen. So we ask people to talk about it, introduce it, learn learn about it first so you can answer questions and introduce it to others. If you know anybody in the film industry, let us know. Thank you very much. Here's also a question. Thank you, Mr. Fresco. My uh, question consists of two related questions. My first one is, how do you envision the transition from a monetary system to the resource-based uh, economy? And the second one is, how do you realize the independent uh, existence with, without the, the monetary system as we know now, on an individual level? Thank you. Vision the transition is very painful. A lot of riots, a lot of deaths. It's not going to be smooth. When women march for women's rights, you know, in America, they didn't have the right to vote, women. And only in the old days, people with property could vote. If you had no property, you couldn't vote. And the women marched for women's rights. They had rotten eggs thrown at them. Every bit, every step in civilization was fought. The flying machine, if God wanted man to fly, he'd have been born with wings. That's what the church used to say. Well, if God wanted man to wear clothing, he'd have been born with clothing. <laughs> to live in the house, he'd been born in the house. <laughs> that's some ridiculous stuff. I never met a minister that is well read. I haven't. And one minister said to me, God, in his infinite wisdom, makes it rain to make the plants grow. So I raised my hand and said, why does it rain at sea? He said, come up here and hold your hands on the beat the chair. <laughs> now, is this the same person? He should say, you know, I never thought of it that way. I don't know why it rains at sea. Why does he get mad? Because he's insecure. A person that's secure is not afraid of ideas. They'll fight back like you guys are here. You're fighting back. 
I love that. And that's what we need. Because without criticism, the Venus Project cannot grow. And that goes for all of us. We have to learn to listen to other people, even though they disagree with us. But if you've got a country with managed news, I don't think we'll put that on the air. I don't think we'll put this on the air. They're determining what you think about and how you think about it. I don't know that if I answer your question, I'm trying to. I'm not trying to avoid it. Can we go to another question? Because a lot of people are asking. Yeah, I've got another question. Um, oh, okay. I, uh, you talk about a lot of technology and uh, emphasis about technology. Uh, what uh, social structure would you like to change? And uh, another part about human nature. Isn't it uh, human nature to follow groups and trying to join groups? And if so, how can we... Uh, can we keep this to one question? Yeah, how can we uh, make um, a social strategy to make people free from the known, free from groups, free from everything. But it also translates into the bone. Okay. As you probably know, automobile companies used to hire lots of people. Today, machines pick up the cars, put the wheels on and the amount of people are decreasing. When you get rid of people in industry, you don't need heating, lighting, pensions, funds, vacation. Machines will eventually occupy most production methods. And the people will not have the purchasing power to buy the products turned out. That's the end of the free enterprise system. It has nothing to do with the Venus Project. It's a social evolution. If you don't understand that, you can look up government records of employment in industry and how it's being replaced by machines. It would take every person in America today to operate the telephone company if you didn't have automatic switching. So there used to be lots of women working in a telephone company, plugging in connection. They're gone. And when I was a kid, women used to operate elevators, they turn the crank and never quite get to the floor, you know. Today you press 20, always start to the floor. And if you go to any airport today, there are trains without people on them that take you any place on that airport. So people are being moved out. In another 10 years, there'll be no pilots in airplanes. It's happening. Most pilots set the course and they don't have to do anything. But in the near future, they'll be moved out. You can think about it. Today, most computers are connected to other people. In the future, computers will be connected to the environmental and to the environment and all be connected to one another. For instance, in the agricultural belt, you'll have electrical tentacles that reach into the soil. When the water table gets low, the water is automatically pumped out there. When the nutrients get low, the nutrients are pumped out there. You don't need a man out there regulating things. You can automate it. So people can go, when, you know, when a new technology would come into the workplace, today it's very threatening. You lose your job, you could lose your family over that. You lose your purchasing power or your home. But in the future, when new technology comes into the workplace, we give people more time off because we can produce more and let them go back to school and be contributing members of society, learn how to be creative. Spend more time with their kids. In other words, if you work today, <clears throat> some people spend an hour driving to work and an hour coming back. And some people can't afford a break job because the wife says, I've been wearing the same dress for three weeks. I need something new. He says, I need a break job on the car. And he says, oh, maybe I'll postpone that for a week. If his brakes fail, you die. If you operate a Mercedes, he's got a beat up Volkswagen. So there's no need to have any old cars on the road. Everything will be new and updated. And people will be brought up to expect change. We're brought up to the good old USA. When you're brought up to expect change in everything, you look forward to the future. You know, in times of war, they allocate any resources they need to make bombs and go kill people, 
and keep it updated continuously, why don't they do that in times of peace to make housing for everyone, medical care, education? We can do that today, but we've never turned science onto how to make a society without booms and busts and how to make things more efficient, how to clean up pollution. We haven't used the methods of science in that way, and that's what we're asking for for the Venus Project. that there is something threatening our society and uh, I would like to have your opinion uh, what can we do to stop Monsanto or yeah. the, the RFID chip that they are planning in uh, mm -hmm. to bring into our party mm -hmm. <laughs> education if you don't educate people as to what you know about those things, they won't change. So when you leave here, like if I speak to 500 people and they all like what I say, I say, if you do nothing out there, nothing will happen. I have no power, Roxanne has no power. So we're talking to you to tell you <clears throat> a little bit about the world you live in. You know, there are disastrous things happening all over in this culture within the monetary system. And if you get fixated on one issue and work for years and years and years on that issue and, and you have a politician that works in your favor, the next elected leader can wipe it all out. So it's just as easy to understand a new social direction and work towards it because working patchwork in this system is not going to solve the problem. We talk around the issues in this system and we never address the social system and the monetary system. And that's what needs to be, that's what we need to educate people about. It's urgent and nothing will fix things or make it just and equitable in this system. Any other questions? Um, yeah, actually, I have a question. Um, well, actually, I have a whole bunch of ideas now and also a, a few points of criticism, but I don't think this is the forum, so I'll just let, let it be one question. How can we contribute our own ideas, our own philosophies, our own doubts, our own, um, you know, how can we contribute to, uh, with our criticisms and our ideas, to this specific project? First, yeah. First of all, we'd ask you to learn more about it. There's no way within this two hours you can understand it. It's over 70 years of work. So we have books, we have videos. We ask you to join us in, in the exhibit after this. We have books and videos there as well. And um, learn about it. If you have questions after that, you can email us directly. We're very accessible. We also have the Zeitgeist movement where a lot of people are contributing a lot of things. We have the the venusprojectdesign.com where we have thousands of people, professionals, we have a professional database of people who want to work with us when the time comes because we also want to do a first city. Um, we can go over that and as you can see it up in the, in the show area. So we, we are accessible, you can write us. But learn about it first and that might eliminate some of the questions. We have over 70 pages of of questions and answers on our website and free ebooks on our website as well. It's a lot of information also on the zeitgeistmovement.com. I have a question. How are we going to get rid of the monetary system? Well, we can't do that. It's collapsing. You don't have to worry about that. The monetary system is going out, but people have to know of another direction to advocate. Otherwise, we're going to have fascism, military problems as we will as we will all anyway, but the more people know about this, the easier the transition. Everybody would like to see a smooth transition. So would I. And never has been in social change. I'm sorry about that. It will be painful, unpleasant. If the less people know about the Venus Project, the more difficult the transition. They always project their own values. Anyway. They picture a bunch of scientists in gray, 
You will work in Area D. You, Area K. That's Hollywood. Well, based on books like 1984, Brave New World, Atlas Shrugged, they're written by artists who know nothing about technology. You don't need to abuse people. It's cheaper to uh, mechanize rather than hurt people. They're trying to make technology the scapegoat today, but it's not technology you should be fearful of. It's the abuse and misuse of technology within this system. Because, you know, it's people who created the rack. It's people who make bombs. I think um, Arthur Clarke said if there's a war between machines and people, you know who will start it. Yeah. I have a question here. Uh, two years ago I saw a video where you talked about you were making a big project in Ecuador and uh, I haven't been able to find any information about how the progress is going and what's happening there. So. I, and that must have been a misunderstanding in some degree because um, we were looking to move to Ecuador at one time before Zygite's addendum came out, but then we realized where we were moving to after we became more well known was too remote. You couldn't even mail anything from there. So uh, there, there is no large project in Ecuador that we're working at. At one time when we visited there, there was a politician who wanted to do a museum of the future of Jacques' work, but he never got reelected. So. Uh, here, um, I sent a bunch, I sent a bunch of questions to Zegas from the Netherlands. So I don't know, maybe they already asked you yesterday or two days ago. Had a meeting with them. Um, so, if you repeat, um, uh, did you have uh, uh, any contact with uh, uh, people that might be interested even in this system? That, uh, it's very bad, as you very well explained, but they might be interested to assist like multi-billionaires that. Okay, they are all corrupt, and maybe most of them, but maybe some are willing to uh, to give a hand. Or some countries like Latin America, where the socialist movement is sort of moving forward. And did you get any? Ah, me. Did you try it? Well, really, this movement is at its early stages. It's a little less than than a year. Um, we we would like to address the Latin American countries who are beginning to share resources within with one another but we haven't made contact, we're trying. Um, we have not met anybody who can put up funds yet for the first city or, or the movie, but we are working on that as well. We are talking to people, so we'll see. There are people translating the Venus Project into Chinese, Japanese, all different languages. Volunteers are doing that. And that's as, as well as we can go. Peter Joseph said, and there are about 50 million people that now know about the Venus Project. So it's happening all over the world. Not as fast as you would like, but it's happening. It depends on what you do when you leave here, how smooth the transition will be. A lot of people ask us about the transition and when it will happen, but Jock and I have no power. We have no money. We have put, we haven't been, we've been working, I've been working with Jacques for about 35 years on this project and we have sponsored it all through outside jobs. So um, we never had any sponsorship. So, you know, a lot of other people now are beginning to learn about it and putting up their own funds and doing whatever they can to make this known to the rest of the world so it'll happen that much faster. So you assume the first city will not happen in this system, it should happen after collapse? No, the first city may happen in this system. We look at the first city as a research city of those people who are working on this project, working towards the next city, doing the blueprints, doing the automated machinery towards a more advanced technical city for the next city. We also look at it as a place where people would be to produce media and information, books, videos, gaming, all sorts of things, educational material that would be put out to the general public. A lot of people come to Jacques and say, well, can you make me a city when things collapse with a wall around it so we'll be safe? This is not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about a city that would be reaching out to the, to the rest of the globe. People would come and visit and go back and build a city in their, their area. 
So we're not interested in building cities where people can live comfortably because if, as, if, as this system starts to crash, there'll be people who will be invading that comfortable city when they don't have things. It's a, it's a global problem and the Venus Project is a global initiative. In spreading awareness uh, of the Phoenix Project, how do you deal with uh, personal interpretation? Well, we try and keep it as clean as possible. We ask people to read the books and videos. There are people who are, they even took Jacques' pictures, they made a website, and they're proposing their own interpretation of what they think the city would be like without even getting in touch with us. Um, so we've asked them to stop using our pictures because, and, and if they want to do a first city to work with us, but as long as people go out on their own and do what they think we're talking about, there'll be less chance of making it happen on, on the real initiative for the city. So we ask people to work with us, learn as much as they can about it, and see what we can do about making the city together. People are trying to raise money by using our photographs as a Venus Project. And they even call themselves a resource-based economy. Another article appeared that Fresco was financed by some big fat corporations or one believes in one world government, <laughs> or, you know, the one world government of the banks in control. That's all lies. And they say, when are you getting your next check from Moscow, Jack? When are you getting your next check from Germany or, or the Israelis? We are not connected with anybody. But they tell those stories to turn you away from this type of thinking. They lie, just like the Republicans lie about the Democrats and the Democrats about the Republicans. All politicians lie. And the... The more famous we become, the more crap you're going to see out there about the Venus Project. Fresco smokes cigars or he works for United Drug Company. Whatever they want to say, they can do whatever they want. But you know what we stand for. If that bothers you, question. We do talk about one world, but their one world, new world order, whatever they call it, is corporations controlling the earth with everyone subservient to them. It's just the opposite in the Venus Project. Thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, which study would be uh, most contributing to the Venus Project? Well, the lies that are out there. asking what study would contribute most to the Venus Project. Now you study H.G. Uh, Wells outline of history. You also need information in lots of different areas like the tyranny of words by Stuart Chase, Mind in the Making by James Harvey Robinson. Fresco can't in this time fill you in. You have to do some work. If you really want to know what makes people the way they are, as it, mind in the making helps you. So I can recommend on our website, we have a whole list of books we don't sell. You have to get them. And that's like Korsivsky's uh, Science and Sanity. There are many wonderful books, but they don't tie it all together. They just give you communication, technology, electronics. But if you want an overview, the book is called uh, it's a really a world without money. The best that money can buy. That's a book we prepared from all this information. The best that money can buy because there's no money. So there's no reason to rob you. You I'm going to go in your home if they have access to things. We would say also for the students to study anything in the physical sciences. Yeah, yeah, computer science, robotics, that's the future. 
This is management on the way out. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, hello. Um, once this Venus project is uh, successful, successful, and uh, will there be any need for a leader of some kind? Because uh, technology can uh, do things that are awesome. But uh, they can they can decide what's best for us. But will there be any leader necessary in this project? No leaders, no technical elite, no elitism of any kind. For example, we'll make a lot of sailboats, lots of them. You don't have to fill out any forms or get along with fresco. You just get in the boat and use it. If you want to be a movie actress, if you don't go to bed sometimes with a director, you may never get a picture contract. So no one can pinch your ass anymore or try to manipulate you because there's no money, no way of paying off anybody, no social gratification, no leadership. That's where you have the automated trains. That's where at an airport they have a scanner. It shows you every plane in the air and nobody there makes decisions. They say this plane is coming in and it's handicapped or something wrong with it, so you have to remain in the air until this plane lands. You see what I mean? There's no reason for anyone to be corrupt, unless you can think of a reason. Hi. Um, say the project, the Phoenix project is successful. Uh, the entire world gets converted to cities and everything you told us about. What, if at that time, and just say it, it happens, I mean, uh, it's not very likely, but let, let's say it does, let's say an individual or a small group starts to sabotage, starts to poison the water or whatever. You say there will be no armies, no police, who will stop them? Why, why don't you run needles in your own body? Because you feel that pain. I can't see a world where everybody is cared for sabotaging it. It's only when you leave certain people out, Swedes, blacks, Orientals, if you keep them out of the system, you're going to have trouble. So I see no reason to sabotage. You have to have a reason for it. You put out of your house, or Fresco discriminates against you. He says, I'd like to sail a boat. And I say, there's 15 people ahead of you, so you wait your turn. And if I had a bad day with my wife, I'm a little angry at you. I don't want people controlling anything. They loused up everything they've ever tried. All history is loused up by human beings. Humans kill more human beings in the name of God, the religious wars. Humans drop bombs on cities. Humans guide guided missiles. They don't go off on their own. Humans stretch people apart. Humans give them the electric chair. Don't you understand that by now? Humans fuck up the world. <laughs> it's not science, technology, it's stupidity. They're not educated and it's really not their fault. You know, it's humans that are serial killers. No machine ever said, you know, if you have a laptop, you usually Saturday, Sunday, give me a day off with you. God damn it, don't work the hell out of me. No machine that I know of ever hurt a human being, except that it wasn't designed too well. Your fingers or your hair might get caught in a rotation. But today, there are machines that stamp out automobile parts. Now, if a guy put his hand in the way, it was flattened out in the old days. Today, there's different instruments. So if you put your hand away, the machine doesn't come down. That's technology. When I was a kid, policemen used to blow a whistle <laughs> to stop traffic. Now they're all gone, there are lights up there. In the future, you'll have proximity units on your car, so if you got mad at that guy, you couldn't drive your car anyway. It would stop. There are no signs, drive carefully, school children crossing. In a school district, it says 15 miles an hour. The power output to your car will be 15 miles an hour. And they don't leave it up to people. It isn't that people are bad, but people can only run about seven things at, at the same time. Machines can do thousands of things at the same time. So 
when you're driving a car, if your kids are fighting, you turn around and say, you kid, stop that, you can kill a lot of people. You can't run into another car. We want dialematic units in the future. You dial where you want to go. The art center, the music center, no one drives cars. This is today. Today, your traffic jams. You can't even move anymore. There's a place called Miami Beach. On Saturday and Sunday, you can't even get there. Traffic's so heavy. But the answer is simple. One seventh of the population gets off every day of the week. Nothing is ever jammed anymore. Very easy. These are not difficult problems. What is difficult is politicians know nothing. So there's no reason to have bars on your windows because nobody steals anything anymore. If you have access to the necessities of life, if you don't, you go right on. And there are people that want to patch up their society. Excuse me, they call themselves the green architects. They want to put trees on the roof. Well, that isn't changing anything. You're going to have the same problems because nobody thinks in terms of redesigning the whole fucking culture, which is loud stuff. <laughs> understand uh, you don't like to use the monastery system but when you want to start to build uh, the Venus project I think you need a lot of money how, how do you want to start without using money yes we do need funds within this system we are proposing a new system there'll be transition periods I was how you get from here to there and you know, there's going to be many different scenarios about how that might come about, but we do need funds today to do certain things. In this culture, we are all prostitutes. You know, when you sell your voice to sell toothpaste, you're prostituting your voice. When you um, want to sell something else in advertising, say you dance for some advertising, you sell your, your body, your dancing. I used to do architectural renderings. I, I sold my artwork so other people can make buildings that I didn't believe in that wear out and break down. We live in that system today and we depend on it to make things happen, but that's not what we're advocating because we know the detrimental effects of it. Uh, hello. Uh, I was uh, wondering something. I've been following you guys for a couple of year now, years now. And um, I've been hearing about this work with DMT, dimethyltryptamine, by Alex Gray and uh, Dr. Robert Lanzen. And I was wondering, coming to awareness, it has a lot of effects, so if you guys are in contact with, uh, with them. No, we're not at all. Uh, is there by any chance a possibility if I give you a slip of paper with them or anything? Because, well, he's doing some great work at the moment and you might be interested. You'd have to send us the information. Yeah. Through email? Sure. Okay, I will do that. Okay. Thank you. I, I, believe, I believe for the future that you're uh, actually envisioning for a resource-based economy, you should build a shared vision among all humanity. And I think right now that means we have to actually kill some barriers that we currently have in our societies and that we are attached to a nation, we all belong to a country, we all belong to a culture. We all belong to a specific religion, race, ethnicity, whatever you want to say. So do you believe that in future we should all put that aside? Not put it aside. You have to be educated out of it, like if a verse is not wood. Or when I was a kid, normal people used to wear a rabbit's foot around their neck for good luck. The rabbit had four of them, didn't do any good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't discuss things with people that say, dear God, it hasn't rained for six months, my plants are dying, I need rain. Get up off your ass and dig an irrigation ditch. Water the plants and put everything on God. You know, I, I need money for a kid to educate my kids. What are you, the boss? You know, if you believe God knows everything, what are you telling him what to do? 
all the time. Take care of me, my family, my Aunt Mindy is sick, she's suffering. He says, gee, thanks for telling me that. I didn't know any of that. No. You know, we're such simple people. We make God in our own image. Then if you don't follow the Bible, you go to eternal hell and damnation. That's really the work of a psychopath, not God. <laughs> Man doesn't even conceive of and When you take books out on general semantics, you will understand more the grammar of motives, what people are talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. You know, like I said, when the president said, God bless America, who the hell are you to tell God who to bless? <laughs>